This is Mark, and welcome to episode 31 of Nerdology. And my special guest today is Mr. Rob Irwin. Hey, Rob. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Not a problem. Now, the reason we've uh, we've got you on as a guest is um, I figured I'd get someone who really knew their stuff on this particular topic, and I can't think of anyone better. Um, we're going to be talking about Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. Yes, we are. I can't wait. Amongst other things, I'm sure we'll ramble off onto other <laughs> other Star Wars sure or other will. sci-fi related things as we go along. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So we we were chatting online about. Um, the build-up to the movie coming out, and I think we took slightly different approaches to um, our uh, experience in in terms of the build-up to the the release of the film. So I was very much trying to avoid spoilers as much as possible. I'd seen the two main trailers, mm-hmm. and that was about it. So I, it gives you a rough idea of some of the things that are coming up but it still leaves the plot pretty much untouched whereas am i right in saying that you sought out or were aware of spoilers prior to the film coming out uh, a, a bit of both i was i was seeking them out actively mm-hmm. but also some of the sites i was frequenting like uh, one called making star mm-hmm. uh, I'd, I'd stumble across them at times as well um so yeah, a, a bit of both there, and I guess before we start, should we warn people that there could be spoilers in this episode? Yes, I think that's probably a uh, a good idea. So yes, um, we will be discussing plot points from the new movie. So if you haven't seen it yet, what on earth are you doing listening to this? Turn <laughs> off the podcast, go and watch the movie, have a ball, unless mm. it's really not your cup of tea, but I can't imagine it, you would not enjoy it, um, and then come back and listen to us once you've seen the movie. Yeah, so Lester, work colleague, spoils it for you as well, because I'm oh. sure everyone will be talking about it when everyone goes back from the Christmas holidays. Well, um, I've managed to avoid being spoiled. Um, I kind of left the social media for two or three days in the lead-up to the film coming out just because I was so paranoid about someone spoiling it. I, I read a post from someone saying, well, that's just blown Star Wars for me. I wasn't actively seeking it out, and somebody posted... A spoiler on my mm. timeline so i'm like right okay i'm i'm gonna just switch it all off and go in as unspoiled as i could and i think that certainly heightened my enjoyment of the film there are certain things that kind of watching the movie you can see it unfold and you think oh my god that's going to happen but having mm. the the foreknowledge i don't know whether that would have spoiled it for me or not um well for me it, it, it's funny because spoilers uh are things that don't really spoil movies or TV shows for me, if that makes any sense. I'll try and explain <laughs> what I mean. I I can be told what will happen in a show mm-hmm. or a movie, but until I see it happen, yeah. it hasn't really happened. Mm-hmm. You know? So you could say to me that Darth Vader is Luke's father, say, for what? Empire Strikes Back. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and and not, not that this was the case in my case because i was five years old and we didn't have the internet in 1980 and you know things were a lot simpler back then it was a lot simpler so this wasn't my actual example but if if you told me that i could still go into the empire strikes back and still be wowed by the moment where it's revealed Mm -hmm. um because sometimes knowing these things events just doesn't phase me it's it's very strange so i knew a lot about the film which you were alluding to earlier i i knew roughly the plot of the film from start to finish i even jotted it down before i went in to compare uh later on my blog and i got most of it right so these spoiler sites were very very good at what they do Mm -hmm. but i was still happy to see the film and i was still experiencing it for the first time when i saw it so i didn't feel spoiled at all so let's go right back to the beginning Mm -hmm. so your relationship with star wars how did that start off i think we're roughly about the same sort of age um, oh, I'm I'm 40. I'm going on 41 mm-hmm. in May this year. Yeah, so just a mere I youngster. Was, that's right. <laughs> I I have memories of my father and brother going to see the original Star Wars, mm-hmm. which came out six months after the US in Australia. Okay, so it would have been late uh, 77. So I was mm-hmm. two and a half, um, going on three. Yeah. And I can remember them going off to the film. I can remember them leaving through the front door and Mm -hmm. being told, no, you can't go with them. It's it's not a movie for you. I can remember that. Yeah, me too. Um, 
<laughs> really? Yeah, my brother is five years older than me, and uh, I would have been four going on five. And mm -hmm. um, I remember being very upset because my brother got to go and see it, and I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can remember that feeling. I can see them walking out the door in my mind's eye. And what happened after that was my brother came home, and in those days, movies would have uh, programs. Mm -hmm you know, for, for certain big films and there were pictures in it yeah. and, uh, and words, which obviously I probably couldn't read very well. Mm -hmm. And he was collecting the action figures. So I would play with those. Yeah. I have vivid memories of, um, land speeders and, mm -hmm. and the action figures. Uh, he had two land speeders. He painted one of them black. So he had like two <laughs> different looking vehicles. Okay. I can remember that. So I was playing with the toys and looking at the pictures and wishing I could see a film uh, years before I actually went and saw a Star Wars film, uh, mm -hmm. which was 1980 or late 1980 uh, when it came out here with my dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was um, fascinated by the action figures. My brother had not a huge collection, but just a lot of the main characters, so Han Solo, Chewbacca and mm -hmm. Darth Vader and those. So um, that kind of sparked my imagination. And although I hadn't seen the film, um, I spent probably more time playing with those toys than my brother did. Um, so I was desperate to see the film so by the time 1980 rolled round I was just that bit older and my parents felt that that was the right age so luckily um, a cinema in Exeter where I live which is no longer um, was running a double bill so I got to see Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back in one hit and that was amazing wow. and that just fueled the imagination even further absolutely just just thinking about those action figures i can't recall well obviously i was very young so mm. obviously i can't recall much before that anyway but i think that were probably one of the first examples of action figures that a lot of people played with yeah you yeah because the 80s were very big for action figures but mm. we're talking like 77 78 78 yeah. really mm -hmm. um i don't think people would have played with many collections of action figures before that they may have had dolls and maybe had an action man or something, but, mm -hmm. you know, a bucket of 20 or 30 different figures. Well, eventually, I think they only started off with eight or 12 or something. And even then, you, you know, what I... back then you had a, a piece of cardboard <laughs> and you had to wait for your action figures. So your parents oh, would, right. uh, would buy you this, um, how did they describe it again? The starters kit or something along those lines. And um, That's right, for Christmas. Yeah, bless them, because they hadn't yeah. quite got it organized in time. Here's your um, Christmas present. It's a piece of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> my best, my favourite ever Christmas present as a kid was the Millennium Falcon for the, the oh, one wow. that goes with the action figures. That was amazing. Do you know, I never got that toy, even mm -hmm. though it was my favourite vehicle, and even though I had tonnes of action figures and tonnes of play sets and tonnes mm -hmm. of things, I never got that. So probably about 10 years ago when they reissued a new well they didn't reissue they made a new version of the millennium falcon it's okay. slightly bigger than the original toy mm -hmm. it's it's more in scale with the figures i i actually went out and bought one of those and you know i still haven't unboxed it it's in the garage That's crazy <laughs> but i just needed to buy it well it's so big and mm -hmm. i know it's so big because i've looked at reviews of it i don't know where to put it the original There's... seemed pretty big but then again i suppose i was a little kid at the time so yeah, and I mean, the original is still big-ish now, but mm -hmm. the, the one they uh, they put out later, they, they reissued one in the same size as the original, mm -hmm. but then a few years later they did this much bigger one, and uh, it's it's massive. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is truly massive. Not as massive, though, as the one, here we go going off on tangents, <laughs> as the one they had at San Diego Comic Con last right. year, which is in scale with the 12-inch figures. Wow. So if you think of how big a 12-inch figure is and then how yeah, big the Millennium mental. Falcon has to be to be in scale with them, mm -hmm. they made one of those. And they're actually going to sell them. I don't know how many people will buy them. I'm sure a few, but uh, they're pretty expensive. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, but no, just getting that on Christmas Day and unboxing it and you're getting all the little stickers that you had to put on yeah. and um, getting it all ready. And it's just amazing. And the hours and hours of fun and uh, entertainment I had from that because um, certainly at that sort of age it would have been around it must have been sort of 80 or 81 um, quite often you get toys at Christmas and then they perhaps lose their appeal after a few weeks but that just kept going and going and going and going oh it would it would as I say it was my favourite ship and I never had one when I was a kid uh, so you know I mean I didn't have too many other bits I had um, 
a uh, snow speeder. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was about it in terms of the vehicles. But I had quite a few of the figures because I started collecting them. My brother kind of lost interest because he was that bit older. So he had more important things to be worrying about than action <laughs> figures. So I kind of... So you uh, never... I was going to say, you never had the torn torn with the op- opening stomach? Oh, yes. Stomach? Oh, yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> I had one of those. That was yeah. good fun. <laughs> no, they were great. They were great. So, yeah. It, it, and also, it kind of fueled your imagination. Because as a kid, especially with Empire, um, it finishes on that massive cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. And for a, a child of seven going on eight, three years to have to wait for the next instalment is a, an eternity. So yeah. having those action figures, you can kind of play out your scenarios of what you think is going to happen next and uh, but no they were they were great you know one of the mm. um, uh, George Lucas really knew what he was doing when he signed his contract with Fox in terms of uh, keeping the rights for the uh, for merchandise he mm. was switched on well, the, definitely there's a famous quote of his that was like if you didn't make films what would you be and he said a toy maker <laughs> you know in an interview I don't know whether it's from the late 70s or 80s or something but yeah I've, I've, he has said that as well and it was just so, yeah, very canny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing that struck me about The Force Awakens, going back to, I suppose, the topic of this episode. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> was it, it managed to capture, in my mind, the spirit of the original trilogy, which I felt got a little bit lost in the prequels. You may have a different opinion, but um, in some ways it's almost like a remix of the first movie. But I think mm. there's enough that's new and interesting to just keep it fresh without it looking like a, a reboot. I don't mm. know what your thoughts were on, on that side of things. Yeah, it, it does capture that spirit. And if you had to condense that spirit into one word, it's probably fun. Mm. Um, you know, the prequels, although they have some interesting and you know cool moments, mm-hmm. they didn't feel fun on the whole. Um, I mean, that, Darth Maul, that whole scene where, you know, the Duel of Fates music comes in and he lights up the, the dual lightsaber is amazing. You know, it's really iconic. Well, it's cool. It's yeah. very cool. Yeah, but there just wasn't enough of that. And also, I forget now because I've listened to so many podcasts, somebody made a really good point about um, how much you might like the the prequels. You kind of always knew where it was heading, so there was not much of a surprise factor whereas with this new instalment um you don't know what's going to happen next next and it just gives you that extra enjoyment factor Um, unless you're me of course reading well (laughs) 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 Uh, in my brain i was almost seeing it going tick yep they did that tick (laughs) yep they did that oh they didn't do that and then you know there, there are there are things they filmed which haven't ended up in the movie apparently the, the yeah i've been reading about jj that. made was uh, cut down by about 20 minutes so mm. i'm really looking forward to seeing those as extras on the the dvd so there were spoilers that came out like mm. the film will start with a lightsaber floating through space yeah and it's luke's lightsaber that. from bespin mm-hmm. and of course the movie doesn't start with that however i do believe that was shot so that mm. may end up on the uh the extras on the oh. dvd and also, didn't they shoot, or they were talking about shooting a scene with Hayden Christensen as a, a force ghost talking to his grandson? Yes, yes, they've they've talked about that. Mm-hmm. Um, all sorts of scenes. Uh, more scenes with Leia, mm-hmm. for example. Um, we we see when that um, star system is being destroyed by the yeah. Star Killer base. We see a, a woman on a balcony, mm-hmm. and we think, "Oh, look." look at that poor woman she's about to be obliterated with her planet Mm. there was a whole segment a whole scene with her and leia because leia goes to her and tells her to go to talk to the senate Mm. about uh the first order and she says you know why can't you do it leia and leia's like oh you know i can but i wouldn't escape from the system alive i'd end up having an accident or Mm -hmm. eat something that disagreed with me um and so on so there's this whole scene where you sort of know a bit more about that character in the final cut she's just a woman on a balcony on a planet that gets destroyed Mm. but in in the original cut there was a bit more to her there was a bit more to Leia I would have liked to have seen a bit more of Leia actually Um, she had a fairly small role well also um, of the new characters uh, Captain Phasma um, played by Gwendolyn Christie yes uh, probably most famous for her role in Game of Thrones Um, I felt she was perhaps a little bit underused but then I read that she signed up for episode 8 so maybe 
this was like an introduction to the character and then we're going to see a lot more of her maybe in the next episode possibly i hope so because she really was you know captain letdown in this mm, um it's a shame leading it yeah leading up to it you see her because she's such a a tall imposing figure mm. her armor is chrome That's so it's a really, almost um, iconic costume isn't it oh yeah it's almost like the armor from game of thrones almost has mm. got that vibe and even on the red carpet um premiere from la which i watched um through the the live stream Mm -hmm. they're interviewing and they're saying how about captain phasma and she's saying well she ain't a captain for nothing i'm like oh wow she's going to be really cool Mm -hmm. and yet what did she do in the film she ticked off john boyega for not wearing his helmet yeah and then she turned off the star killer base's shields um once she had a gun pointed at her that's all she did (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know it wasn't really much i think i'm hopeful that um she'll have a, a bigger role to play later down the line I mean, talking of yeah. female characters, I think Ray is a phenomenal character. Um, yeah. In my opinion, I think the, the whoever did the casting on this movie got it so spot on. Um, John Boyega and uh, Daisy Ridley, two relative unknowns, certainly to American audiences, um, were superb, absolutely amazing. Definitely. And uh, Oscar Isaac as well, I'd throw in. Yeah. I I said this to my wife as I came out when she was saying, what did you think? And obviously I had a million and one things to say. Mm-hmm. But one of the first things I said was they got the casting so right. I, yeah. I totally bought into all of those characters. They gelled. I They felt as natural together to me as the original cast yeah. did. You know, um, mm-hmm. just amazing. Absolutely amazing, the casting. Slightly disappointed by some of the online reaction to having a female lead being so prominent in the movie. Uh, I think there's, oh. there have been a few, well, how can I put this politely, morons who have a real problem with there being a strong female character. I, I thought she was superb. I thought she really carried the movie well. Um, it's It's very easy to be quite a sort of one-dimensional character who just goes around beating people up but I felt like she actually brought something to the character and made you care about her definitely definitely whether it's her scratching those uh numbers into the wall of mm-hmm. how long she's been on the planet yeah. there's so many of them on that wall you think oh she's been there a long time um the flashbacks she has to being a little mm-hmm. girl you know although brief it was like oh this is a sad story here yeah you know what's been going on yeah and, and i mean these people who complain about a female lead they're the same people who said a stormtrooper can't be black i mean it's just yeah. freaking ridiculous <laughs> it's, it's just you know i i've seen those comments i haven't seen a lot of them probably because i stay away from the yeah. more moronic types online mm-hmm. but yeah i'm aware of them and i just i don't get it i don't get it at all no, it's disappointing, but I think certainly um, maybe it says more about the people that I tend to follow on online, but uh, everyone, as far as I can think, I can't think of any um, negative response at all. Ev- everyone I've seen whose opinion I actually value uh, has said what a great job they did. Yeah. And I have to agree, they were, they were really, you know, hit the floor running. Absolutely, absolutely, and... You know, uh, for for young girls seeing the film, in the original films, they had Princess Leia. She mm. was quite feisty. She fired a gun better than the guys and took out stormtroopers, you know, <laughs> when they were panicking and trying to get her busted out of that cell. Uh, but here, wow, so much more of a lead character. The, yeah. uh, you know, for, for cosplay reasons, mm-hmm. for um, role I mean, I've heard one reasons. complaint was that, oh, how come she seems to uh, pick up the whole force thing really quickly um you know she she has this kind of flashback when she has the moment with the the lightsaber but the Mm. way i looked at it was her whole life's been kind of building up to this moment she's had to survive because she got abandoned by her parents she has to be tough she has to be able to um you know go above and beyond what the average person would do to be able to to live um so i think that element of her character was already there and this was just like an extra edge to the character that you see when the lightsaber comes into the storyline and there's two things i'd say to that one is something we see in the film and that's you notice that every time kylo ren uses the force or does something that she's Mm. aware of 
she seems to learn from it. So mm. he's almost her teacher in a sort of perverse kind of way in this yeah. film. But also some people have speculated that, and this is speculation now, this is not spoilers, mm-hmm. this is not anything real, this is just people spitballing. What if, as a very young girl, she was at Luke Skywalker's Jedi Academy uh-huh. and it gets busted up by Kylo Ren and she gets sent off to Jakku to hide her? Maybe temporarily, but her parents, who are Jedi perhaps, um, you know, don't end up coming back because they get killed by Kylo. Mm -hmm. So has she had some sort of force training already and is maybe unaware of it? Has her mind been wiped? There's another theory going around. So, you know, there's a lot of speculation going around as to how she might have got there, who her parents are. You know, people thought it might have been Han and Leia originally. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, um, because... I don't buy into the whole mind wipe thing too much. And also, I think if Han was on Jakku and he had left a young girl on Jakku, well, not only would he have gone back there a hell of a lot earlier to get Mm -hmm. it back, but if he met a young woman from Jakku who was his daughter's age, he would put two and two together. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Leia, especially with her force sensitivity, would have Mm -hmm. picked up on it when they met, when they hugged. Um, so I don't think she's a solo, Mm -hmm. although she did have that habit of finishing Harrison Ford's lines at times, which was (laughs) cute. I thought that so... that trio of of she and Harrison Ford and John Boyega worked really well. I thought the the chemistry and the the comedy between them was really good. Oh yeah, and it goes and back it to almost... that fun factor as well. That you were saying about before, you know, there you know, there was a little bit of humour in the prequels, but not a great deal to my memory anyway. Um, whereas this, you know, you had real laugh out loud moments. Yeah, the, I, I mean, that's the difference between, I guess, George Lucas writing and Lawrence Kasdan writing. Lawrence Kasdan wrote The Empire Strikes Back. We yeah. already know his track record with, mm-hmm. with these things. Whereas, you know, George Lucas' humour is more Jar Jar Binks stepping in Bantha Poodoo, yeah. you know, or getting his tongue stuck on an electricity outlet mm-hmm. or whatever that was. Um, yeah, that's kind of slapstick for the kids and it might even have its roots in... You know, Charlie Chaplin, you know, Mm. perhaps you could even draw that parallel, you know, and maybe George does. But on the whole, this kind of humour that Lawrence Kasdan has done, it just works so much better. Mm. You know, just those snappy one-liners from Harrison Ford, you know. um, I love the bit where Finn called him Solo. (laughs) (laughs) He said, you call me Solo? (laughs) Just just stuff like that. It's just fantastic. And one new character we haven't mentioned yet is BB-8. Oh, just great. Mm. You know, and when we all saw him in the original teaser trailer, Mm -hmm. I guess people thought he was CG. We soon learned he was a practical effect uh, because they rolled him out at some uh, show somewhere or other. It was like, no, no, BB-8 is actually real. People can't figure out how he works. Mm -hmm. I guess it's magnets or something like that. I assume so, yeah. Um, And just, you know, you think it's hard to replace someone, someone, something (laughs) like R2-D2. Yeah. But he's already on par with R2-D2 mm-hmm. for me. And, yeah. and I'm a massive fan. And I've loved R2-D2 for, you know, 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. But in one film, he, he cracked it. Yeah. You know, he, he it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you give these well, things personality. They take on a life of their own, don't they? That, that's right. You give them a the sex and a personality. And yeah, it, <laughs> it's a machine. Gosh. And that little moment where they did the thumbs up between him and uh, Finn was great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, it's great. And I was, I was going to say a moment ago, I almost wish that the next film could have had Harrison Ford with those guys in it as well. Mm. But I understand the role he had to play here. He was the Alec Guinness of this film. Yeah. You know, he brought well, all the so young many heroes together. Aren't there? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's something yeah. that George Lucas himself had done throughout, well, not just the original trilogy, but also uh, the prequels. He liked to use motifs that he'd used on the previous movies and have like that kind of recurring element to it definitely definitely and you know i i appreciate that kind of storytelling um i also appreciate that in the standalone films or the anthology films as Mm. they're getting called um it it probably won't be that they'll be all new stories yeah simply set in the same universe Mm -hmm. so we're we're getting the best of both worlds there are the, the callbacks but we'll also have these other films coming out like rogue one 
um, which will just be a whole different thing. You know, you can start to tell different stories in the Star Wars universe, like tell Star Wars as a heist film mm-hmm. or tell Star Wars as some other kind of film. You know, if they do a Boba Fett, I'm sure it'll be like a, a more of a Western yeah. sort of thing, maybe a man with no name Amazing. kind of film. Yeah. You know, you can do all sorts of things with Star Wars, and now that it's not just in the hands of one guy mm-hmm. who only wants to churn out one script and make one film every three years, they can do so much more. I do feel a little bit sorry for George, because obviously it's very close to his heart. It's his baby. Um, and he has made a few comments, which I think he's recently retracted. But, yeah, he's... Um I think he's a bit yeah. upset, possibly, at just how much... I sold my babies really to white slavers. It. Yeah. That's a pretty extreme statement. But, um, and as soon as it came out of his mouth, you could tell he was trying to grab those yeah. words and pull them back yeah. in straight away. Yeah. Now I can kind of understand that, you know, obviously he's passionate about it because it's his thing. Um, but I think it's... Uh, I think it's just reinvigorated it and given it a new... A freshness, but also in a... In a way, it's kind of gone back to what made the original so good. It's just that, I don't know, if you could bottle it, then they'd be cranking out these movies left, right and centre. But I think there's just that Mm. special magic about those original trilogy that they've seemed to have tapped into for the, the new movie. Yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of this this debate that's going on at the moment because George's comments have largely been along the lines of, oh, well, they've given the fans what they want. Mm. I would have done something different. And, of course, he did do something different. He wrote whole treatments for the next three films and yeah. gave them to Disney, which they didn't end up using. Mm. And, obviously, George just wanted to push the story along and keep telling the story, whereas here they've really gone not for a reboot but certainly to, to remix a lot of episode four and even elements of the the second and third in the original trilogy yeah uh i think just to for the younger people especially just to give them that experience and and hopefully in the next film we won't do as much of that hopefully in the next film we we move on i mean i guess there will be some parallels with empire strikes back Mm -hmm. because hey ray has turned up she's with luke skywalker she's going to get trained Mm -hmm. you know q thinking of yoda and and luke on dagobah in Mm -hmm. empire um, Kylo Ren is off to see Supreme Leader Snoke. He's going to get some more training. Maybe we'll see maybe some cuts between them both training. Um, and then do they end up having a fight at the end of the film? I don't know. You know, what did, what did you not think a lot of, of rumor Snoke about two at the moment when you saw him on the screen. I I already had an idea of what he looked like mm. because there is a. Um, a book called, I think it's from the Illustrated Dictionary of mm-hmm. Star Wars Episode um, 7. There are sort of concept pictures of him, and someone must have got a hold of that book before it was um, in stores and, yeah. and taken a photo of that page. And so I'd seen pictures of what he would look like. I didn't realise he would project so large as a hologram. Yeah. Then I suppose and saying that, uh, if you go back to Empire, when, you, when we first see the Emperor, he's just this enormous sort of head and shoulders shot by yeah. the old... Um, um, hologram display. So I suppose it's that's exactly what I thought of. You know that that very big sort of fascist imagery, almost like where everything's just massive and the mm. leader looks down on you and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, they're playing with that there. But as to who he is, well, we want to talk rumors now. Yeah, I've seen a, <laughs> a few things bandied around. <laughs> Some people speculate that the emperor has cloned himself, and I mean, this harks back to some old storylines from the Star Wars graphic novels of the Mm -hmm. the 90s, like Dark Empire and things like that. And maybe the cloning hasn't gone so well, which is why he's slightly deformed looking, like his mouth is really tiny, Mm -hmm. but he does have a forehead sort of like the Emperor with that crease down the Mm -hmm. middle and those lines on either side. So there's an Emperor-ish look about him, which might make people think that it's, it's a... It's a version of the Emperor that hasn't cloned quite so well. Mm-hmm. I tend to think he's a new character. He's this guy who's been off in some remote system, you know, looking after stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's seen an opportunity when the Empire's come falling down. He's um, maybe been able to gather some forces and mm-hmm. and such if he's out in a remote region and, and possibly go about things that way but you know the the, the Snoke is Emperor theme is, uh, is certainly strong with some mm. uh, I've seen salad. one theory that he could be a character called uh, Darth Plagueis Plagueis yes yeah who gets referred to in the um, the prequels 
who he does Am because right he was the he emperor's was the emperor's master. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And he learned to yeah. conquer death or something, didn't he? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because although we're told that Palpatine had to, or Darth Sidious, I should mm. say, had to kill his master because that's how the rule of two works in, yeah. you know, in Sith law. Mm. If this guy could conquer death, what if Sidious thought he killed him but really didn't? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's another one of the theories I've heard too. Mm. See, that's the thing but, I like uh, about this. You know, you can you can come out with wild and crazy theories, and uh, it just fires the imagination. Yeah, well now that we've got something to hang on to, because prior to this film coming out there was next to nothing, and then as it got closer we had some some comics and some novels started to Mm -hmm. trickle out. There's a whole um, thematic sort of series of novels and comics now called The Path to the Force Awakens. Okay. Um, if, if you type that into Google, folks, uh, you'll find comics and novels that fall under this umbrella. And they're starting to fill in the past 30-odd years mm-hmm. of, uh, of Star Wars lore. So they, they could be quite interesting for people to read because they're certainly canon yeah. now that uh, Disney has uh, thrown out all of the old extended universe and said, yeah. no, none of that happened. Everything from here is canon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can read comics, you can read novels, and be safely assured that it's all as canon as the films. Mm-hmm. Mm. And there's Star Wars Rebels on uh, on TV too, isn't there? Which is kind of filling in that gap between... Um, well, in fact, that's that's a little bit earlier, isn't it? So that's going... It's just before episode four. Yeah. Yeah. So... But that just gives I've... you an extra level of storytelling and sort of background and world building it does and i mean i i when that first came out i speculated oh this series will end with these guys Mm -hmm. stealing the death star plans or something but uh, i think that might end up in rogue one now (laughs) i love the um the decision to make the characters look like the sort of ralph Macquarie um paintings that were used for the sort of concept art for the original movies i think that's such a great idea Definitely such a great, talented artist. And in fact, even for the, this film, the Stormtroopers' mm. look originally was more Macquarie-ish, especially the helmets. Yeah. They now have that sort of... Uh, <laughs> once you see it, you can't unsee it. They now have the Donald Duck helmets. Um, <laughs> if you take if you take the current First Order helmet and actually uh-huh. paint the base of it yellow, it looks like a duck's bill. And you, you once, as I say, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> and I think I would have preferred the Ralph Macquarie version of the helmet that they were going to use, but mm-hmm. uh, oh, it doesn't matter. They look pretty cool. And as you've alluded to already, we've got the um, the offshoot movies. So normally you'd have to wait a few years for your next fix, but because of the way this works, admittedly it's not the, the next episode in the story, but you're still getting a Star Wars movie. In this case, every year, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I mean, the the fan the fan part, I mean, we do this with Doctor Who and we do this with other fandoms too. We think, oh, will people understand it? You know, like, you know, there's always the the fear we have in, in Doctor Who, I guess. You know, what mm-hmm. if we bring Paul McGann back? Oh, will fans understand that there's an eighth Doctor and an eleventh Doctor? Mm-hmm. Well, of course they will. You know, and will casual viewers understand it? Of course they will. Um, but yeah, I still I still have that fanish fear with the anthology films. Will will the casuals get this? Will they understand this isn't the next Star Wars film, even though it says Star Wars at the start? <laughs> um, but it's something people just get used to. I think that there yeah. are standalones now, and there, and there is the ongoing saga. I think um, another Disney property now, uh, the Marvel universe, has kind of set things up quite nicely so that. Yeah, you know, your everyday audience is kind of geared up now to expect that kind of expanded kind of universe based around a a particular property. So Mm. I think that's helped sort of pave the way for what could be quite a few Star Wars movies now. Do you think there's a danger that it could become, you you could have too much of a good thing or... I think so. Mm. I think when you make too much of anything, it dilutes. Mm. I think we're already seeing that with Marvel to some degree. Um, I guess with Marvel, though, you have different properties. Yeah. So, you know, it's not an Iron Man film every year, but, mm. you know, you've got all the different um, characters. Yeah. But with a single universe, gosh, I think it's much easier for it to dilute. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think, though, they want to make their money back. Uh, the $4 billion they gave George... <laughs> They're already going a long way to doing it. The first movie, aren't they? (laughs) 
But they're going to go out with a big flourish and say Star Wars is back. And for these next uh, few years up until 2019, I think, yeah, we'll have pretty regular films. But mm-hmm. hopefully it will drop back a little after that. Yeah. You know, because you can't have too much of a good thing. Yeah. Uh, that's that's my only worry is just... Obviously, they've got their their sort of plan of how they're going to release all these films. And in one way, it's really good because you're never that far away from your next fix. But on the other hand... Yeah, is it going to get a bit overkill? I'm hoping not. Well, we were talking earlier about three-year gaps between Star Wars films back in the day, and mm-hmm. I used to fill that in by seeing other great films yeah. and by playing with my action figures and mm-hmm. by imagining things that would happen. Mm-hmm. And we didn't even have a lot of multimedia stuff. You know, there might have been the game on the Atari 2600 ah. or in our, or in arcades. Yeah. Um, or a Viewmaster. Or a Viewmaster, yeah. you know, you had your action figures, but you, there weren't really tie-in books. There were a mm-hmm. few novels in the late seventies by um, Brian Daly, mm-hmm. uh, the Han Solo novels, but there weren't there weren't ongoing series of novels. There, there just wasn't a lot of stuff. You used your imagination. Yeah. But I guess it's a different world now, and you know, both in terms of how kids react to stuff and want to be stimulated, mm-hmm. and uh, also with the way people want to market stuff and make money. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean, they, you know. I mean, the publicity machine went absolutely crazy in terms of the toys and merchandise. I mean, you had wasn't there a whole day of just web broadcasting, people unboxing Star Wars toys? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, there was. <laughs> Did you sit and, and watch every hour? <laughs> no, no, I didn't because, I mean, look, we should, we should address the elephant in the room. Go on. And the elephant in the room is I've done a... A Star Wars podcast, well, a hybrid Star Wars podcast. Yeah, for a yeah, long talk time. about that, please. Uh, well, it's called Who Wars, and you know, I'm putting the finishing touches on the final episode today. Mm. Um, and the reason Who Wars is ending is, gosh, probably about six months ago, I I started to realise I was really falling out of love with a particular aspect of Star Wars, and it mm. was to do with the marketing and such, particularly, and fandom to some degree, mm. to the point where I I didn't have the um, the energy or the go forward to to want to do a podcast about it anymore. I still love Star Wars. Obviously, you can tell by the way I'm talking about yeah, it sure. here. I, st- I still love it. But there were aspects of it that I was really starting not to love. And I know that can sound so crazy because Star Wars has always had a big hype machine behind it. There's mm-hmm. always been a lot of toys and such. But I don't know. The lead up to this film just killed something inside me, <laughs> if I can be that dramatic about it. And I realised I just couldn't do a podcast anymore about it. I just mm-hmm. couldn't... Just something changed in me. And as I say, I still love it. I went along, I saw the film, I thought it was great. I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to the next one. But something has changed in me. And, and you know, I was talking earlier about the books and comics, The Road to the Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. I probably won't even read many of those. You know, and this is coming from a guy who owned each and every one of the extended universe novels and could talk your ear off about, you know, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. And, you know, we could go off on a tangent about how Kylo Ren is very much like Jason Solo in the extended universe, who was Han and Leia's son who mm-hmm. went to the dark side, blah, 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 blah. You know, I can see parallels there with extended universe. Mm-hmm. Um, but will I go that far now in the new, new order, the new uh, Disney regime? Probably not. And it's nothing to do with Disney themselves but i think Mm. just the marketing around the film yeah i think maybe i mean to draw a parallel with music i don't know if you're the same but at times you go i go through phases where i like a particular band and i just have to consume everything that they've done and Mm -hmm. you just get to that point where you've listened to it so much that you kind of need to freshen things up and just step away from it for a while because it gets a bit too much um and I think you could say the same about all the sort of additional stuff that goes around any big property like Star Wars or, you know, the Marvel Universe, whatever you want to sort of pick out. So, you know, you might come back to it later down the line. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't know. I was really surprised at myself mm-hmm. because I never thought I'd feel that way. You know, it's always been such a big thing and I wouldn't have started a, a podcast or a hybrid podcast about it if I didn't feel that way, Mm -hmm. but maybe it was partly doing the podcast that did it just being so immersed in the films and the news and everything. I I don't know. Well, it does change things. I mean, I do, um, or occasionally do a podcast, uh, 
with JR, Lee and Simon called the Blue Box Podcast, which is a Doctor Who mm-hmm. podcast. And yes. um, just through doing that, because you're reviewing episodes and things like that, the way you watch the programme changes. So mm-hmm. it could potentially kind of ruin your enjoyment of the programme because you're watching it in a different way. You're You're being more analytical, whereas perhaps normally you might just sit down and and take minor quibbles at face value whereas when you have to sit down and talk about it for an hour or in JL's case an hour and a half two hours two and a half hours <laughs> um, you know you you have to perhaps pick out things and and sort of analyze them a bit more and perhaps that takes a little bit of the fun out of it mm. but um, no I I think as long as you're enjoying it then you should stick to it. But I think you've made the right decision. I think um, I've really enjoyed the shows I've heard of, of Who Wars. Um, oh, thank but, you. But, you know, if if you're feeling you're not really getting that sense of enjoyment out of it, then I think it's worth refocusing your energy onto something that you feel will kind of give you that buzz again. And I understand you've got something new in the works. Is that right? Uh, well, yes. The decision I made months ago now was to to continue on the Doctor Who side of things. Mm-hmm. And so later this month, um, after we get Who Wars out of the way, there'll be the first episode of a monthly uh, podcast called The Doctor Who Show. Very mm-hmm. simple title. And being monthly, it'll be quite different to the weekly and fortnightly podcasts mm-hmm. out there. Uh, it'll have a lot of segments. Uh, very much like Who Wars in terms of being like an audio fanzine kind uh, of vibe. Like a magazine where show. Pe- yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. where people come on and do their, their regular segments and so on. It'll be more chatty than Who Wars. Who Wars mm-hmm. has had a lot of monologues in it, yeah. uh, people sort of sitting down with microphones, putting together material on their own. Mm-hmm. Most segments in this new show will have at least two people chatting Okay. Uh, from you know the opening of the show with a couple of people right through. There will, there will be a few solo bits and pieces, and they're solo for a reason, mm-hmm. uh, but I won't spoil why that is. Ooh. But yeah, that that's coming along, and I'm really excited to be doing that because mm-hmm. if we if we can, I was talking earlier about how it's not just the marketing, but also the way fandoms changed around Star Wars as mm-hmm. this new film has come close. And I think as any fandom expands exponentially, the number of idiots, morons, etc. expands as well. <laughs> They're the people who, as we said earlier, don't like a female in the lead role. Mm-hmm. They don't like a black stormtrooper. They don't mm-hmm. like this. They don't like that. You know. Um, they spend all day saying Kylo Ren is Luke Skywalker. It's just people who drive me crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> that last one's at the smaller scale of things, of course. I'm not saying that was important <laughs> as, you know, female leads and so on. Mm-hmm. But when I think back to, to Doctor Who in the wilderness years, and for people out there, that's after the show went off the air in 80, mm-hmm. 89 and uh, came back briefly in 96, but then not back proper until 2005... In those wilderness years, when fandom dwindled down to more of a core group, Mm -hmm. we actually had some of the most creative and interesting things going on, both in terms of what people were producing, Mm -hmm. fanzines, novels, all the stuff that kept the show ticking along. And we also had great discussions in fandom too, because I think it it, it boiled down to this smaller core group where there were less morons and less idiots. (laughs) So I actually have this real fondness for when Doctor Who wasn't on the air. Uh, (laughs) If that makes any sense. And maybe it's the same with Star Wars. Now that there's a new film and it's so massive and fandom's exploded, I, I kind of liked it better when there wasn't. And maybe and going we're just back to drawing those things. parallels with music again, it's when you have you discover that new band and it's it's your band and no one else knows about it and it's your special mm-hmm. thing and then they become really popular and then they're not your band anymore. They're everyone's band. Yeah. So there yeah, might be an element at, of that. Yeah, well, look, a band from your neck of the woods, someone like Muse... Mm. Um, yeah, very, first, very much my neck of the woods, just down the road. Yeah, yeah. Um, their first album did all right in the UK, mm. uh, didn't set the world alight, but it also did all right here in Australia. We were very early adopters, if you like, of mm. Muse, and we're one of the countries that they have toured the most. Um, I've been on board with them since day one, and mm. over the years they they did get absolutely massive. Yeah, uh, and so I can I can see parallels precisely with someone like Muse, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and in some ways, they became less interesting to me the bigger they got. And it, it sounds so hipster, doesn't it? Oh, I liked them <laughs> before they were popular. Um, but you can sort of see where people are coming from when they say stuff like that, because it is mm-hmm. true. 
that sometimes uh, a subculture or a, a fandom or whatever yeah. is cooler and is more interesting when it is smaller. Yeah. When it's more of a cottage industry. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe that plays into how I feel about Star Wars at the moment too. Well, you never know. I mean, these things change and our moods change, so I guess you're probably not going to rule out doing any more Star Wars related stuff. Oh, look, never never rule in anything out um, in life. But, mm-hmm. yeah, for the moment, I, I can't I can't see myself doing it. But, yeah, who mm-hmm. knows? In a year or two, I might have some brilliant idea. I might suddenly start reading all the new Star Wars novels and think, I want to do a book show about the Star Wars novels or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who knows? Who knows, honestly? But at the moment, I'm just, I'm just over that sort of aspect of it. I still mm-hmm. love it, but there are aspects of it I just can't sort of face anymore sounds quite dramatic i don't mean to be so dramatic but <laughs> no, i think <laughs> that's how i feel i certainly i've had experiences along those lines where i mean back in the, the sort of couple of years in the lead up to doctor who coming back um online fandom suddenly in my experience seemed to kind of explode from out of nowhere mm-hmm. and there mm-hmm. were lots of forums springing up and uh at first, it was quite an exciting thing because you were connecting with all these people, whereas perhaps for your average fan back in the 80s, for some people, it was quite a solitary experience watching Doctor Who, and they may yeah. not have known too many other fans, whereas now you've got this place you can go and there's, you know, everyone loves the thing that you love. But then mm. you start to learn that perhaps they don't all love the thing that you love or they really hate something that you love, and there's no kind of... You know, on some of these places, there's no kind of reasoning or argument it's just you know it's black or white and that really turns me off so i do tend to avoid forums um i really don't uh enjoy that aspect of fandom i prefer certainly the world of podcasts um Mm. you know i get to listen to people who you know you get a bit of a feeling for people who like the same kind of things that you do um, or just speak about things in an interesting way and you tend to latch on to that um, because there's such a wide choice I think there's something for everyone out there especially in the world of Doctor Who podcasts it's crazy the number of, of uh, shows that are out there um, yeah yeah I latch on to with Doctor Who podcasts people who are my sort of vintage mm-hmm. because I know they've experienced the same things I've experienced in the same order I've experienced mm-hmm. them in and although that doesn't preclude people being quite interesting who might be, say, 25 at the uh-huh. moment, like I think of someone like, um, I don't know, Hayden on uh, oh, Diddly yeah. Dumb. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's quite a young guy, mm-hmm. uh, but he and I chat about things and he's really into Classic Who. He hasn't experienced Classic Who in the way I did, no. but we can still talk about it because mm-hmm. he's still into it. So uh, it doesn't preclude the younger people, but yeah, I generally tend to listen to people of my vintage, uh, mm-hmm. you know. One of my favourite necessar- shows. Sorry, one of my favourite shows is Mostly Harmless Cutaway. I don't right, know if you know yes. that one. And um, they have a, quite a, a variety of guest hosts that come and go. And uh, one of their hosts uh, is called Kat. And she is coming to it from this perspective of being someone who's been introduced to the show from the, the new series, but is kind of dipping her toes into the water of the, the classic series. And I find it really fascinating to see her take on shows that I know so well uh, Mm -hmm. and seeing them for the first time and hearing her kind of opinions on on what those shows are like and that to me is a another kind of interesting um, element to, to you know a really good podcast yeah, because context is everything. When I say, you know, people who haven't watched them the same way we mm-hmm. have, mm-hmm. when we watched these things for the first time, it was in the context of the same time period. Mm-hmm. It was in the context of shows on TV were more like plays on television almost yeah. Than, yeah. Than, than modern TV shows. Mm-hmm. But you watch something from the early 80s today com- and compare it to Game of Thrones, which you might be watching next, they're nothing alike. <laughs> They're, they're worlds apart. They're yeah. not 30 years apart. Yeah. They're 30,000 years apart. And how does someone who's grown up on modern TV view something like that? I find that very interesting myself. Mm. I think you have to have a, a certainly a different kind of... Go into watching older TV with a different mindset. You have to kind of acknowledge mm. that 
as you say, things were done differently and the pacing's slower or, you know, the, the visual style is different. Um, but if you can buy into that, then there's a whole wealth of really interesting stuff out there you can, you can get into. So I, mean, I, I love things like the Avengers, the old um, series with Patrick McNee. Um, mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a great series. Um, and lots of old TV. I just, I find it really interesting just as a, a sort of a historic document just to see how TV was made back then. And, and the same applies to old Doctor Who, you know, 60s Doctor Who is, I find it fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And and just how weird things could be, I think. Things mm, saying like yeah. the, pr- the Prisoner, for example. Oh, God, yeah. You know, does a, does a young kid today think of old TV from 50 years ago could, could be that weird? Well, mm, yes, it could. Yeah. You know, watch this. You know, you might like it. <laughs> <laughs> So we, Where were we? We were talking about The Force Awakens, yeah. weren't we? <laughs> uh, one thing I haven't touched on, which I I thought was quite important, is um, the music, because John Williams comes back to do the score. And I, I don't know if this is right, but I've heard that this is going to be his last Star Wars score. Is that right? I've heard rumours to that effect, but nothing concrete. Mm. Um, I'm glad you've brought this up, though, because I have some pretty strong thoughts on the music in this film. But mm-hmm. if you want to go first, by all means. No, I mean... Uh, obviously there are the familiar themes that we've heard from the original trilogy which obviously have that kind of emotional attachment which helped to to give you that sort of feel good factor when you're watching the film they're obviously thinking that through but um, of the new music there was this particular um, kind of motif that he was using I was thinking I've heard that somewhere before where have I heard that before I was racking my brains and I don't know if this is something that you guys got in Australia, but back in the 80s, um, the BBC would show the old um, black and white serials. So you had Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and all these kind of Buster Crab serial mm-hmm. movies. And of course, George Lucas was inspired by Flash Gordon to make Star Wars in the first place. That was his, I think, did he want to make a, a Flash Gordon movie, but he couldn't get the rights, so he decided to write his own yeah, take Yeah, that's on how it. the story goes, mm-hmm. yeah. And um, Buster Crab, who was a movie star back in the 30s and 40s, he starred in um, a version of Buck Rogers. I think it was a Universal series. And the music, the main sort of theme from that, sounds identical to this kind of recurring theme that comes through in The Force Awakens. I don't know if that was a, um, a conscious thing that John Williams put in as a sort of back reference to the the origins or whether it was just complete coincidence or what but yeah it really struck me as wow I've heard that before and I had to go and look it up you'd want to think it is because he is quite a music historian mm. and, and knows his stuff I, I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be uh, uh, an accident say mm. <laughs> what I was going to say about the music though is I came out of it and as I said sitting in the car with my wife there was mm. a million and one things to talk about one of the other things I talked about besides how well it was cast was, yeah. hey, I recognised all the old familiar bits of music that yeah. he's done in, in new ways and, mm. and really quite beautiful ways, like the Leia theme yeah. when Han and Leia met. was like, oh, this is a killer version of that mm. theme. And there's music from, um, from Empire Strikes Back that he's done in a different way, and that's all good. Yeah. But I said to her, I said, but honestly, no other new music stood out to me at all. Mm. Um, you know, you, even the prequels, you came out of episode one and you had Duel of Fates yeah. in your head, you know, mm-hmm. where from where that door opens and the yeah. chorus starts and Darth Maul's there, mm-hmm. it stands out. Um, episode two had Across the Stars, which is the love theme. It's mm-hmm. like from a, a big, you know, 1930s sort of movie score. Mm-hmm. And although that's such a horrible movie, <laughs> I think I think that piece of music is one of the best Don't pieces hold of back. music. Say what you really the... think, Rob. Come on. Yeah, okay, <laughs> it's a really, really awful movie, and uh, yet that piece of music is one of the best pieces of Star Wars music I think mm. exists. I love Across the Stars, oh. and then in Episode Three, it kicks off with um, I think the music's called Battle of Heroes or Battle of the Heroes or something mm. like that. Again stands out and it also plays again when they duel on Mustafar at the end of the mm. film music that just stands out boom 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 first time yeah so I know it's possible for me to pick up on music the first time in this film no it didn't mm. and as I've said to people I, I'll, I'll have to grab the soundtrack and help 
my brain sort of isolate the music because it must be more subtle or something or maybe I was just hearing the old themes too much mm. or I don't know what it was but no single piece of music stood out to me I know there's a theme for Ray and I know there's um, uh, I think he's written a Scurzo or something for X-Wings right. is one of the pieces yeah. um, but if you ask me to hum it I wouldn't have a clue mm. how it goes mm. and and that kind of worried me in a way I thought ooh has John Williams lost it what a horrible thing to say hey because he's done so much good work what a what a blasphemous thing to say to people who probably enjoy his work but if this was his last score ooh, mm. just nothing stood out to me i'm i'm sorry to say well yeah i must admit i suppose maybe it's just because you've got this whole new episode and you're focused so much on you know, intently trying to follow the plot and trying to second guess what's going to happen next, and maybe that's detracting from the music. I don't know, but um, I agree. I think the the pieces that you're familiar with do tend to really stand out, and maybe the new ones not quite as much. Mm. But I have listened to the um, the soundtrack, and uh, there's some really beautiful pieces in there. Um, so maybe you need to hunt it out and, and have a listen. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. When I was watching the film, and I was even having these thoughts watching the film, I could tell, obviously, that there was music playing, mm -hmm. and I, I thought, that's a really pretty piece of music, but it it wasn't standing out. Maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't high enough in the mix. Maybe it just wasn't gelling with what was on the screen. I, I don't know. It's it's a weird one. As I say, I'm going to grab that soundtrack, help my brain isolate the, the, the scores, and then particularly when it's on DVD and Blu-ray, mm. I can watch it over and over again and go, oh, here comes Ray's theme. Yes, I'm hearing it now. Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> you so know, I take but... it you won't be waiting for the box set. You'll be going straight for the Blu-ray on day one of release. Oh, absolutely. Mm. I mean, I've bought Star Wars so many ways. It would be, <laughs> <laughs> it would be wrong not to buy it multiple times for The Force Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and they often add and remove different things from different releases. So, you know, George does, they're, they're often worth. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, maybe he's given Disney some ideas on how to make money. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> who knows? I know I want to grab it on Blu ray and just experience it at home and really concentrate. And well, I do wonder if they're going to do a Peter Jackson and have a sort of extended version with the, the footage that they've excised and have like a, a, a theatre version and a an extended version later well, down the line. you know, when people were writing about these 20 minutes of footage that's been cut that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the article speculated just what you've said, mm. and and it concluded that J.J. Um, Abrams isn't into that kind of thing. In fact, it had a quote from him saying, mm. the movie I put out is the movie. Okay. You know, there might be cut scenes and, hey, you can watch them, mm -hmm. great, but the movie I put out is absolutely the movie. So unless they do it without JJ's permission, yeah, you know. Yeah, I can't if, imagine them doing No, no. So I, I think that is it. Mm -hmm. But you will probably get some good cut scenes on the Yeah, on the certainly DVD. make for some uh, decent extras on the on the disc. Oh, yeah. You know, 20-odd minutes, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Unless they hold on to them for years like George did with, um, say, the, uh, the scene of Luke Skywalker making his lightsaber. Um, in Return of the Jedi, yeah. which which for many years Mark Hamill denied they even filmed, mm. um, but it was always a fan rumour. And then one day, you know, it popped up on the Blu-ray and everyone was like, oh, look at that, wow. You know, <laughs> I hope we don't have to wait 30 years, though, for that to happen with some of this stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be knocking <laughs> on a bit by that point. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you felt you wanted to say about Force Awakens? Look, I think I think everyone has a different experience going in. It might be based on their age. It might mm -hmm. be based on the way they've watched these films over the years. You know, my wife started watching Star Wars films with Episode One, mm -hmm. for example. She's she's um, younger than me, and that's how she started watching them. <laughs> so everyone takes in different baggage. I, yeah. I went into this film knowing what would happen, but still really excited about what would happen. Others might have gone in knowing what would happen having been spoiled and really upset about that mm. and feeling ripped off you know so we all go into these things in different ways um and so my experience is not necessarily anyone else's experience but my overall feeling was at the end of it mm -hmm. gosh they remixed a lot of episode four we've seen a lot of that stuff before 
but man, I had fun. Yeah. You know, there was still a new story there. The new characters were brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the... S- the, I mean, Star Wars has always been a gritty, used kind of world. That's yeah. been its thing. Mm-hmm. But here, we even had that stormtrooper who'd been shot or something had happened to him, putting the bloody handprint on Finn's yeah. uh, stormtrooper helmet. Yeah. And I thought to myself, is that the first time we've seen blood in mm-hmm. Star Wars? And yeah. it, it may be, because in the past, uh, lightsabers, I guess, have cauterized wounds and blaster bolts have just hit armor and people have just fallen over mm-hmm. have have we seen someone bleeding and wiping their blood on someone else no oh that's new you know uh, i think the power i guess we saw anakin can... Sorry, i was yeah. gonna say i guess we saw anakin burn to death that was pretty yeah, horrific yeah that's pretty grim yeah <laughs> uh, but, but but on the whole yeah there was a slightly more gritty realism to it i thought yeah mm-hmm. this is a star wars universe i can believe in this yeah. is great I mean, the way I looked at it, um, I don't go to the cinema that often these days. I used to go really regularly, but um, just kind of being a dad now, you don't tend to sort Mm. of go out so much. Um, And I've been to the cinema twice in 2015. Um, So Star Wars was one of the movies. and The other one was Spectre, the latest Ah. installment in James Bond. Um, Mm -hmm. I love Daniel Craig. I think it's a really good James Bond. Um... But if I compared how I felt walking out of the cinema having seen The Force Awakens compared to how I felt walking out of the cinema having seen Spectre, I mean, Spectre had all the ingredients that you would kind of expect to deliver a really satisfying movie. So you had um, Daniel Craig, who's fast become one of the most popular actors to play Bond. You've got... um, the reintroduction of the Spectre organization. You've got the reintroduction of a big baddie from the older movies mm-hmm. uh, without trying to get too spoilery. <laughs> so those are all elements that should kind of build up to a really satisfying experience. You know, you have the, the things you'd expect, the car chases, the explosions, the set pieces. Um, but I didn't feel like I enjoyed it as much as Skyfall or Casino Royale. I just didn't quite mm. get the same buzz from that. Um, whereas, I noticed you missed Quantum of Solace from that list. Does that, I don't. I don't think that exists, does it? I think that was just a figment of someone's imagination. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind it. I will watch it. It's kind of uh, it's a guilty pleasure. It's a bit like some people's opinion of the uh, the prequels. Mm, you know, it's one right. of those things that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can sit down and watch it. It's not my favourite of the series, but you know, it's still. Yeah. It's still Bond, but I just felt that walking out of the cinema, having seen The Force Awakens, it, it just felt like such a feel-good movie. And everyone, it's like a palpable. Um, I don't want to get too preachy, but it's like a euphoria. You know, had all these people. Mm. And I suppose it's because we watched it on. I suppose it was day two of release in the UK, and mm-hmm. I, I guess a lot of the people going would have been relatively hardcore fans who had, you know, seen the movies the previous movies many many times and we're really up for it but there was just a real buzz about the the audience leaving at the end you know they they all sounded like they really enjoyed it yeah and look it was the same with our screening and and it surprised me in some ways because as as we've spoken about i was completely spoiled on this film i knew it was coming i knew han solo was going to die Mm. um for the past year, I've known Han Solo, my childhood hero, was going to die. And it, it's actually been this weird thing inside me, like, especially with other Star Wars fans who didn't want to be spoiled, I couldn't really talk to them about it. Yeah. I, I couldn't really say, look, they're going to kill, <laughs> they're going to kill Han, right? Mm. Let, let's have a beer well, and commiserate. Well, Ford has said on numerous occasions in interviews that he had wished that George had killed him off in the original that trilogy was, didn't he that was his idea for return of the jedi his mm-hmm. his rationale in in a nutshell being it, i think what was his quote he's got no mum and dad mm-hmm. he's got nothing he's he sort of fulfilled his role the only logical thing is to sort of kill him off as a dramatic mm-hmm. sort of hero sort yeah. of ending and he said i'm glad he didn't because it meant i could come back mm-hmm. um in these films which is which is good but <laughs> <laughs> my, I'll go off on a tangent. My wife was spoiled on this fact as well. I'd, I'd confided in her. I had to uh, confide in someone that they were killing Han, and, and she knew. How could you? Rob? And I, and I, oh, she didn't mind. <laughs> she's, she's cool. And she, um, 
she was bummed like me because she loves Harrison Ford, mm-hmm. but she said, um, this is why he's so happy on this press tour that he's doing, because <laughs> he knows it's the last time he has to do well, it. Well, that and a, a fairly decent paycheck, I would have thought, too. Absolutely, absolutely, which a lot has been made of, you know, mm-hmm. Harrison Ford's been paid 50 times what Daisy Ridley's been paid, the shock, the horror, and well, you think, well, on one hand, solo. he... He, well, he's a five-decade-long actor. Yeah, um, he's got a hell of a body of work, hasn't he? A hell of a body of stuff. work. She is a first-timer. Of course, they've got her cheap. Mm-hmm. But also, that's the initial upfront fee. I believe she does have points in the film, as they call it. You know, mm-hmm. it's probably like 0.25 or something uh, like that. So she will make quite a lot of money over yeah. time from the film. Um, and those initial reports are just based on the initial like actor's fees. Mm-hmm. Um, which isn't a very fair way to go about it. But again, that's another tangent. Going back to Killing Han Solo, <laughs> for, for this past year, I have had this inside me, and it's it's made me feel quite, again, without trying to be too dramatic, it's made me feel quite weird, quite sick at times, mm-hmm. like we're getting closer to this film where they're going to kill Han Solo. Like, the, my hero, the, <laughs> the guy I've, you know, idolised. I love the Indiana Jones films. Mm-hmm. I love Star Wars. In the playground, all the kids wanted to be Luke. I never understood that. Yeah. They had lightsabers. I had the DL-44 blaster exactly. that made the electronic noises. Um, this is back in the days, kids, when you could go to the school playground and shoot each other with guns. <laughs> um, I don't think that goes on these days. And I always wanted to be Han Solo. And so there was a sense of dread going into the film. Although, weirdly, as I was sitting in the film, I thought, it's going to happen. Just let it happen. Mm -hmm. And when it happened, I thought his death was handled very well. Yeah. It had uh, a reason and a meaning. Um, He he was run through. He's stroking Kylo's face. Mm -hmm. And then his body falls into that abyss. It was like something from a fantasy movie, Mm. almost. Um, Very magical, very uh, supernatural, very... Very strange. And then, of course, I guess Starkiller Base got exploded, so his body got obliterated, you know, mm-hmm. maybe 15 minutes after the fact as well. So what a what a way to go, you know? <laughs> Killed by your own son. It was, you know, there's shades of um, King Arthur there, I guess. Um, and I thought, okay, that was well done. And, and all this dread I had inside me didn't really come to pass. I thought, mm. I thought hey, they've done that well. And although he's dead, I guess there's going to be now 30-odd years of books that are going to fill in the gap. So there's still more Han Solo mm-hmm. stuff to come. There's a Han Solo anthology film where obviously exactly, he's not yeah. going to be Harrison Ford, mm-hmm. but he will be Han Solo. There will be those cracks and, you know, you'll be mm-hmm. able to buy into it to some degree that it's Han Solo. And weirdly, 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 I was okay with it in the end yeah. after a year of absolute dread <laughs> and horror inside me, you know. It I don't know like how a, you... It felt like a heroic way to go. Yeah. It felt like the the right way to go. It wasn't it wasn't cheap. It was it had a meaning to it. Yeah. In yeah. my opinion uh, anyway. Oh, look, and and Chewbacca's reaction, oh, yeah. and and here's here's a question for you. I mean, his reaction is instantly to to snap that bowcaster to his mm-hmm. shoulder and take a shot at Kylo Ren. Mm-hmm. Okay, two things to think about. He doesn't kill Kylo Ren outright, even though he's been nailing um, stormtroopers all over mm-hmm. the place. Do you think, because Kylo Ren, or Ben Solo, mm-hmm. was the little boy who probably would have grown up with Chewbacca, Chewbacca would have been a surrogate nurse to him, I guess, at times? Maybe. Do you think he, do you think he pulled that shot? Maybe he was kind of thinking of Itchy and he didn't want to uh, <laughs> kill off a, a young, defenceless child yeah i had to bring in the star wars holiday special we can't we can't do a star wars podcast and not mention the holiday special of course and i mean chewbacca is so old he would seem like a child but i was thinking about that afterwards i thought (laughs) oh man ben ben solo they would have grown up together and yeah oh now he's firing that bowcaster at him and and look just talking about visceral scenes um with the stormtrooper in the hand Mm -hmm. and the blood how how great was it that Kylo Ren's been gut shot and in that fight at the end he's, he's punching himself in yeah. the stomach to kind yeah. of stay, I guess, conscious. I thought, wow, this is... I think they did yeah, a really good job this Star Wars. of introducing this new baddie. I think he... Yeah, it could have gone horribly wrong and he could have been a bit of a joke, but I felt mm. like just the, the way they handled it, um, 
the 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 casting again was really good. I I must admit I haven't seen anything with Adam Driver in it before, but I thought he was particularly good. Um, I think they the modulation they put on the the voice when he had the mask on was good in as much as you could actually hear what he was saying. Mm-hmm. I guess they kind of watched the last Batman film and decided they didn't want to go down the Bane route. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> um, but no, I. I I thought he was a, a really interesting character, and I think it sets things up nicely for the next instalment. I can't figure out Adam Driver's accent. Mm. In the film, it was interesting, but even off screen in his interviews and such, I I'm normally really good with accents, even mm. you know American ones where you'd say, "Oh, he's, that's you know East Coast, that's West Coast, that's mm-hmm. Southern." They're your three big areas, but you can even sort of narrow it down further than that sometimes. Yeah. I haven't got a clue where his accent's from. It's a really interesting way of speaking. And um, I, so I, I was sort of drawn into the character with the way he was speaking. Um, you know, people have made a bit of a joke that, that he's kind of Anakin-like, kind of petulant, like he likes to smash up stuff when mm-hmm. things don't go his way. And I... I love that scene where the two stormtroopers come around the corner <laughs> yeah. and they see stuff yeah. flying out of the room being smashed and they just turn, turn around, around and go back and the other walk way, off yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, fun. yeah, we've seen this before. Uh, we don't want to be involved here. Uh, and that's an example of the humour in the mm-hmm. film that we were talking about earlier mm-hmm. too. Just fantastic. Yeah. But uh, I, I really like him. I liked when he was talking to the Darth Vader mask and he said mm-hmm. he's, he's struggling the, the light... It's not the darkness that's overtaking mm. him. It's it's actually the light that yeah. he's struggling with, and uh, I I think it's all heading towards maybe a redemption of sort. You would assume so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That you know, if he's already struggling with the light, that he can be brought back. People mm-hmm. say killing Han Solo was his final step to the dark side. Well, it might be for now, but gosh, if he's been struggling, you'd want to think that maybe Ray or someone can bring him back mm. uh, somehow. But who knows? Open for a, a really exciting sequel. Yeah, yeah, and I think this sequel's going to be, um, you know, it's got Ryan Johnson in charge of it, and, mm-hmm. and you know, people on the internet are like Ryan Johnson, he's fantastic. I'm like, I've never heard of Ryan Johnson. I must have then I realised, <laughs> he, well, I had to look him up, and he's he's mostly done a lot of uh, Breaking Bad episodes. Oh, okay, I haven't seen that. I'm probably the only person in the entire universe who hasn't seen Breaking Bad. Oh, you and I make two. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I watch a lot of TV series mm-hmm. and stuff, but that's one that's passed me by. And I've kind of been interested in it from time to time because I don't mind good crime stories. Mm-hmm. And I guess at its core, that's what it is. It's not just two guys making meth. It's, mm-hmm. it's the whole what happens when you're involved in crime and, you know, dealing with bad people sort of story. Yeah. That's kind of interesting to me, but I've never, I've never actually dipped my toe in it. No. I'll get around to it someday, but uh, yeah, not just yet. Mm. One yeah, last so thing I wanted to say, sorry, about the the cast. Um, I don't know if you caught too many of the interviews in the build-up to um, the movie being released, but I, th- I thought it was really refreshing that um, certainly the, the two that seem to crop up most, um, apart from Carrie Fisher, who is a hilarious, <laughs> she's absolutely brilliant, um, just a, an amazing lady, um, were John Boyega and Daisy Ridley and they mm-hmm. both came across as really grounded and kind of having fun with you know the fact that they're in this this big movie some people might let it go to their heads and you know become a bit you know full of themselves but they just that didn't come across at all they just came across as really genuinely decent people and uh, I thought that's quite refreshing to see and and again, great casting, not just in terms of the ability to act, but mm. the people, the people mm. as well. I don't know whether that's part of Disney's casting, whether they're looking for, you know, good people. Yeah. Um, I, I guess to some degree you would. You don't want to hire, you know, a total nutcase, even if no, they are no. a great actor. No, because that it's... tends to sort of uh, cause ripples with the other cast members, doesn't it? If you've got someone who's Mm-mm. being a bit of a an idiot. But no, yeah, they, you they don't struck want to... me as being really... Uh, really switched on but having fun with it at the same time yeah definitely definitely it's i can't say enough good things about the casting it's one mm. of the things that made me happiest about the film actually because yeah. i knew as soon as i saw that i knew well this trilogy is in good hands mm. because mm. these guys have got it already and i'm i'm buying into them mm-hmm. and isn't 
Daisy Ridley fantastic. I want to go and buy a Ray action figure, which yeah. then leads us to that other controversy oh, that there were no God, Ray yeah. action figures what out that there. What's about? She's the main character. <laughs> well, they're... they're there's always two sides to every story, and of course mm. the first side is, we saw Force Awakens last night, we went to the store today and there was no Ray characters on the shelves. Yeah. What gives? Uh, here's a gift pack, it has Finn, it has a Stormtrooper, it has a TIE pilot, it has Kylo Ren, mm. um, might have some other character in it too. There's no Daisy there Ridley. Well. Um, yeah, or, hey, I'm looking at the single characters in packs on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Here's a guy who's not even in the film and they've made an action figure <laughs> off. That's because he's in one of the cutscenes. He, he's some yeah. sort of a police, police constable or something, mm -hmm. and he's in a cutscene, which they cut, but they'd already made action figures of him. Now, the reason why is because they were packaging the Daisy Ridley character with a lightsaber. Okay. And they didn't want to put it on the shelves. Because the big piece of misdirection, which I'd been even hinting mm. at on my Facebook posts for the last six months, saying, guys, there's a huge piece of misdirection on that poster. Guys, trust me, <laughs> look at that poster. There's a big piece of misdirection. And the misdirection was that Finn was holding the lightsaber and everyone yeah. goes, oh, Finn is the new Jedi. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't. It was, it was Daisy Ridley. That's yeah. what they're trying to keep secret. So they didn't want to put the character mm -hmm. out with the lightsaber on the shelves. So they weren't going to put it in the multi-figure packs that came out, you know, weeks in advance of the film and so on. Mm -hmm. That's why it happened. Um, but I think they could have done better in, in having rushed them out onto the shelves once the film was out. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone wants a Ray figure. I would love a Ray figure, mm. you know. Um, and that's that's been the problem. And I mean, this has been an ongoing theme with a, with a lot of uh, films. The most recent Avengers film, mm. people were like, I can buy all the figures, but where's the, yeah, the, no the Scarlett there. Johansson figure? Yeah. Um, and I guess you could say, oh, well, they're probably thinking they're going to sell more Iron Man figures in general and maybe more Thor figures than, than her character, which is a sort of a secondary sort of character. Like like Jeremy Renner's character is a secondary character. Mm. I mean, it does get turned into it's a male-female thing, but I think there mm. are primary and secondary characters in films. Yeah. That's how the toy makers probably approached it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't stop people wanting the figure and being upset that they couldn't buy the figure, yeah. especially as she is the lead in the film. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope they're on shelves now, and I hope that uh, kids, not just little girls, but boys and girls, are buying mm. Ray action figures yeah. and having adventures with them because... That's what you do when you're that age, and it's so fantastic. It's you know, I wish I could be like eight again and playing with action <laughs> yeah. figures. It's, what fun, hey? What fun? I know the feeling. I know the feeling mm. only too well. Mm. So we've we've immersed you in the world of Star Wars, uh, as in terms of getting you to, you know, watch the movie and and come on the show. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, My pleasure. Is there anything that you would like? to recommend to our listeners um doesn't necessarily have to be star wars related but uh, something that you've enjoyed recently um it could be tv movies books music that you'd like to recommend to our listeners <sighs> you know i look around this study and i'm surrounded by so many things from pop culture and and elsewhere mm -hmm. i mean I, I could talk about many things i could talk about my my love for the the essays of Clive James. I could talk about uh, the Flashman novels by George MacDonald Fraser. I'm just I'm stretching my head around. Hopefully, you can still hear me speaking. Oh gosh, there are so many things. But you know, yeah, you know what? I would like to talk about Dollhouse. Do you remember Dollhouse? I must admit that one's passed me by. Tell us about oh. Dollhouse. Dollhouse is a is a TV series. Mm -hmm. uh, 2009 2010 mm -hmm. uh, a couple of seasons of it were made before it was cancelled it's a joss whedon production okay for, uh, for those of you out there who know him through the avengers or if you know him mm -hmm. through earlier stuff like buffy the vampire slayer yeah. or or firefly for example mm -hmm. unlike stuff like buffy and firefly however <laughs> i think dollhouse is really unremarked and unloved um mm. it's it's still in recent memory it's only five years ago that it yeah. finished and yet, you never see people raving about Dollhouse in the way they still rave about Firefly or Buffy, mm -hmm. as I say, you know, or their Joss Whedon programs, of course, but even other shows of that vintage. Um, it's just not warmly remembered at all. And yet, mm -hmm. I thought it was a fantastic show. The, the premise is there is a, a company that can erase people's memories and minds and reprogram them to be anything, okay. anything at all. So... 
you can go to this company and say, I need um, an escort for the evening. This is a really base sort of example, <laughs> I guess. I need an escort for the evening and I'd like her to be well versed in um, art and poetry and, um, you know, enjoy seafood, uh, you know, whatever. Mm. And they can take one of their operatives or their dolls, as they're called in the mm. dollhouse, and wipe their mind and then program them to be everything you need them to be. And, you know, you might... It, well, that's that's the whole idea. It is creepy. It's very creepy. And, you know, it might not just be a date for the night. You might want someone to commit uh, a, a robbery. So why not program them to be a, a cat burglar mm -hmm. and have them commit a crime for you? What, you know, if you've got the money, the dollhouse can make anything happen for you, you know, whether it be more base sort of sexual stuff or whether it be, you know, crime of some kind. Mm -hmm absolutely creepy absolutely scary and i don't want to give too much away um in the early series we have eliza dushku who people might remember as faith in buffy mm -hmm. the vampire slayer she yeah. is she is in the dollhouse as one of the lead dolls and we see a lot of sort of almost uh adventure of the week type episodes where i guess we get used to the concept that she can be programmed to do anything okay you know, they're almost like robots, mm -hmm. you know. And so from episode to episode, she has different skills. Mm -hmm. They often involve fighting and stuff because, hey, fighting is, is fun, <laughs> you know. And, and doing martial arts is, is great uh, for action for television. Mm -hmm. But as the story goes on, we learn more about the organization behind all of this. And the guy in charge of all of this, who is a young sort of computer nerd, um, you know, <laughs> quite, a, quite a fun guy uh, mm -hmm. at first, at least. And then... Because they didn't know where the, whether they'd be cut after the first series, they recorded an episode that leapt ahead into the future and sort of showed where everything is going to go okay. um, because of this technology and how it basically ruins society. Mm -hmm. um, so it has, you know, this, this fun adventure of the week feel. It's got this uh, creepy kind of feel, a very different kind of storyline to a lot of other shows out there. And then you have this basically post-apocalyptic world um, that's been destroyed because of this technology and you think how do we get here from there and then in the second series which they ended up making you learn more about that mm -hmm. and it is highly underrated all of Joss Whedon's stuff is beautifully written mm -hmm. intriguing um, just a delight to watch the actors are great in it I mean if you know Faith from Buffy the Vampire Slayer you'll know what you're getting with Eliza mm -hmm. Dushku she's a great actress but lots of other great actors and actresses in it as well. It's got Audition Lachman, who's um, an Australian. I think she may have been in Neighbours. I don't know. It seems only people <laughs> in the UK watch Neighbours. We don't watch it here, the same as only people in the UK drink Foster's beer. We don't actually drink that here. <laughs> I could go on. Um, you know, she's fantastic. All these other great um, people in it. And, and yet no one talks about it. Mm. And particularly in an age where people are looking for... Where are the female role models? Why yeah. don't we have more women on television? Dollhouse is led by a very female-centric cast. Mm -hmm. Joss Whedon identifies as, as being quite feminist in his ways of uh, thinking and writing and so on. He's very proud of that fact. Yeah. And here's a show with all of that piled into one, and yet it's so unloved and unremarked. It's like people, maybe it was too short and people just missed it and it went by. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'd like to throw that one out there for people to go and watch because I think it's bloody great. That sounds like a great recommendation. So I guess yeah. that's probably out on DVD or Blu-ray or Netflix oh, yeah. or similar. Well, certainly I own it on DVD. Um, mm. I'm sure it's on Blu-ray by now. Um, Netflix is very variable from country to country. Yeah, I, I'm always that. wary of recommending stuff on Netflix mm. because it might not be on someone else's Netflix in yeah. another country. Mm -hmm. Um but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Just look up Dollhouse people okay. and uh, have have fun. It's great. Well, something I came to very late in the day. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the series. It's called Luther. I know of it because of the lead actor, and they keep saying he mm. should be Bond. <laughs> That's all I know about Luther. Idris Elba is a great actor. Um, I first saw him in a, a show that was on Channel Four in the UK uh, called Ultraviolet. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's something you're, you've heard of before. Vaguely, but mm. not, not that I've watched. That's a, I found it a really interesting series. It was kind of a... Um, they were like a secret... Um, 
I suppose they were a part of MI5 or something along, along those lines, and they were vampire hunters. And mm-hmm. uh, he was one of the main characters in that, and I thought he was really good in that. And I've kind of followed his career in other things, so he's been in a lot of movies and stuff. But for whatever reason, I just never seem to get around to watching Luther, which was a, a show that's been shown on BBC over here. Mm-hmm. Um, and they um, put out a, a two-part story over Christmas on BBC, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll catch up. So um, thanks to being really ill in the lead up to Christmas, uh, I <laughs> I jumped on Amazon Prime and they had all the three previous series uh, as a streaming um, option. So I kind of dived in from, from the start because that's the kind mm-hmm. of nerd I am. I have to watch it from the beginning. I can't just jump in. <laughs> I get four. that. Yeah, I get it. Um, and yeah, I was really impressed. Neil Cross is the the main writer who's written for the sort of rebooted Doctor Who, mm-hmm. um, and there's a great cast. Paul McGann's in it for the first couple of series. Um, oh wow! And some some really good actors um, in the ensemble, and uh, I found it really exciting. It's uh, it it's not perhaps going for ultimate realism because it does get quite far fetched. Uh, but it's I found it a really enjoyable program, so I'd certainly recommend that to anyone who's uh, who's looking for something different to watch. It's a kind of crime thriller kind of thing, and he, he, more often than not, he's trying to track down a, a serial killer or some kind of weirdo who's going around trying to kill people. Um, <laughs> and it's it's really exciting, and uh, I'd certainly recommend that. I think it's a, a really great show. So based on what I've oh fantastic based on what I've heard about it and, and now your recommendation I think I would like that as well and can I just say the mm. UK makes spectacular drama uh, um, you know in Australia we have great actors and actresses mm-hmm. we have great behind the scenes people but for the life of us we can't seem to make the same quality of drama that the UK makes and I find myself watching so many BBC productions or, you know, other productions from the UK. It's just not funny. Um, I don't know whether you know how blessed you are with good, good TV. We do have I some don't... great drama programs. You also have some real dross as well, which you probably never Maybe get Maybe we to don't see get that. Because... Yeah. <laughs> we just get the best of. <laughs> yeah. But no, we do. We are very fortunate. We do have some great programs over here. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's definitely one to investigate. Excellent. And for for listeners who have uh, younger people in the house that they have to try and keep entertained, maybe Luther's not for them, but um, <laughs> my son has recently really been taken by um, the reimagined Thunderbirds, Thunderbirds Are Go. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't, but I have kickstarted the new old episodes, ah, if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah, no, I've seen that uh, doing the rounds. That sounds like a really interesting project but this is um Mm. this is something that um jerry anderson's son has put together so they've they've kind of taken the some of the elements from the original series so although the characters are now cgi rather than um puppets they have used um weta from new zealand to create um the um locations so the locations are models but they have um CGI characters and vehicles, and uh, it's great. And he loves it. He he's really gets really excited when the music starts up. Um, <laughs> the, I, oh, I can't remember the, um, the guy's name now, but the the chap who's done the the music for it is um, associated with Doctor Who. He does the arrangement when they do the the live shows, and I've forgotten his name now. That's really awful. Oh, uh, is his name Ben something? Yes. Yeah. Ben something. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Ben. I do apologise. I've forgotten your surname. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's done kind of like a reworking of the original theme, which is really good. And the incidental music is really good. And they have some uh, quite a nice variety of different stories. Sometimes I do wonder, because my little boy is only just two, you get the occasional one where it might be a little bit scary, so you have to kind mm. of you know gauge it. But, um, but no, he loves them. Um, uh, he's just that little bit too young for me to get the toys from yet, but um, maybe next year he'll be getting a, a Thunderbird 2 for Christmas. You never know. Yeah, 
Oh, Thunderbirds <laughs> is great. Or should I say FAB? Ah, uh, you did that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Rob. I really appreciate you taking the time out. My pleasure. I, I, I love to talk about this sort of stuff. I don't get to do it enough, actually. You know, stuck all the way down here in Australia, different time zones. <laughs> You know, when I'm uh, when I'm up, you're all in bed, and then when you know you're up, I'm in bed. So it's it's quite tricky. <laughs> well, if you ever find yourself stuck for uh, someone to talk to, if you want to come back on again sometime, I'm sure we'd be more than happy to have you back. Oh, well, let's find something, and uh, I'll do that. That sounds great. Thanks ever so much, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.